Welcome to MBR This Week, a look back at our leading stories. This week, the US Securities and Exchange Commission announced findings of market manipulation by former PGG Rights and Chairman Guangling Lai and fraudulent accounting by the New Zealand company's controlling shareholder, Agria. The findings follow a three-year investigation by the US regulator, but a cache of documents obtained by MBR suggests the SEC's inquiries are not over. In the first part of an MBR special investigation, we report on accounts filed in China implying Agria controlled by Mr Lai may have provided false financial information for its New York Stock Exchange float. Agria was at the time promoting the rapid growth of its agri-tech business in China, interest that led to an invitation to invest in PGG rights in, but the documents paint a different picture. So what attracted PGG Wrightson's board to Agria in the first place? Here's MBR's Tim Hunter. One of the things that appeared to attract them uh, to Agria in the first place was this idea that they would have some sort of a, a tie-up, a, a sort of pathway into doing business in China. Um, and in this, they appear to have been utterly deceived because Agria had no business of any stature or substance in China whatsoever, as it now uh, turns out. So whatever aspirations Wrightson's had about um, those links appear to have been, uh, again, utterly naive. The liquidator for Andrea Moore & Co says there's nothing left for creditors now the clothing designer and her partner have been bankrupted. The fashion label went into receivership in December at the request of BNZ and has been in liquidation since January. It had raised $750,000 in new capital in August 2016 via Snowball Effect. Official records show Miss Moore was bankrupted in October and her business partner and husband Brian Malloy in November. An investor complaint was made to the Financial Markets Authority about the fashion label's capital raise. The FMA says it's continuing an investigation. Meanwhile, Ms Moore has turned to working in real estate for Sotheby's International. Sir Owen Glenn's Kia Investments is chasing Eric Watson for the $50 million a London court ordered in his favour, after the bend-on entrepreneur had said he couldn't pay. This week it became apparent from an Auckland High Court ruling that Sir Owen is considering whether to seek receivers for Mr Watson's Valley Trust. That trust is already in dispute with inland revenue. In July, a UK court ruled Mr Watson had obtained fellow MBR rich lister Sir Owen's investment in Project Spartan by fraudulent misrepresentation. Sir Owen put roughly $250 million into the project. Sir Owen has declared that if necessary, he will go to the ends of the earth to pursue Mr Watson and alleges Mr Watson is hiding money behind trust and company structures he controls. To this effect, Sir Owen has obtained an order from Justice Christopher Nudgee telling Mr Watson to front up in court or be held in contempt. Housing Minister Phil Twyford concedes the Kiwi Build programme has hit some headwinds and mistakes have been made. Mr Twyford still believes it can meet its target of building 1,000 affordable homes by June next year, despite so far having built just 33, with another 77 under construction. He also admits the uncertainty over Kiwi Build Chief Executive Stephen Barclay, who has apparently not been at work since the beginning of November isn't ideal. Mr Twyford is however satisfied that by Christmas 50 families will be in affordable homes. But you know I'll be up front with you we've had some headwinds it's not easy uh, and there's a reason if it was easy we probably wouldn't have this housing crisis but um, Kiwi Build is affected by all of the things that actually created this housing crisis in the first place. We've got not enough workforce because there hasn't, simply hasn't been the investment in developing the workforce. We've got construction companies falling over almost every week. We've got incredibly expensive building supplies and high build costs. We've got a planning system that stops you at every turn and uh, not enough, the councils can't borrow enough money to invest in the infrastructure. So the residential construction industry is broken. 
Nationals housing spokeswoman Judith Collins wants to strip references to the environment out of planning laws in an effort to speed up housing developments. She says instead of pushing references to climate change in the Resource Management Act, as the government proposes to do, the law should be taken out the back and shot. There needs to be a separate planning law for development and a separate environmental law focused on environmental issues. Ms Collins says it's clear the government will not build 1,000 affordable homes by next June. What I'm seeing from Phil Twyford is that what he said today sounds exactly like a description of his own 12 months have just gone by, which is that he does not know what he's doing. He's doing a lot of time spending um, how can he spin anything, and what he's not doing is producing a product that people want in the places that they want it. Air New Zealand is expected to throw its commercial weight in on increasingly angry discussions about the future of airports near Queenstown. Earlier this year, Queenstown Airport gave up on its plans to expand the airport after locals said they didn't want any aircraft noise. But at the same time, the number of passengers through the airport continued their double-digit growth. 177,000 passengers moved through the airport in October this year. Queenstown Airport Corporation has been investigating using Wanaki Airport, but locals aren't keen. And Air New Zealand has said in a leaked submission that it saw a potential need for a completely new regional airport to replace both Queenstown and Wanaka. Other alternatives are said to include aircraft using Invercargill Airport, but with a long drive for Queenstown visitors, or establishing a regional airport near Tarras, east of Wanaka and north of Cromwell. And looking at the markets, MBR's Calida Stewart Menteith speaks to Greg Smith of Fat Profits about the week that's been. Well, certainly, uh, as you mentioned, trade has continued to dominate, and I suppose that's weighed on markets, particularly globally. Uh, but look, we did have that positive development at the G20, uh, and I think it was some signs of progress with China extending an olive branch in terms of reducing auto tariffs and uh, Trump also indicated he might intervene in the Huawei saga. So uh, that, that's, I think, given investors some hope. Uh, I think you know, locally it's been interesting as well. There's been some good positive updates, uh, both in terms of the economy and also in terms of the corporate sector. Uh, obviously, M&A activities still somewhat rife. Uh, and yeah, the, the updates that we saw during the week, um, a couple of positive ones. Certainly the government, of course, opened its books as well and shows that um, we're tracking pretty well in terms of New Zealand Inc. on track to lower that uh, national debt to GDP below 20%. And looking ahead to next week, NZX is rewriting its rule book, but Shoeshine suspects the Financial Markets Authority has played a major role in sticking a tricky little regulatory clause into the rewrite that will outdo all the good. So for more on that and other stories, head to our website and have a wonderful weekend. To unlock your two free articles a week, head to nbr.co.nz.